live. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our third virtual talk with Tall Ships Expeditions Canada, Brigantine Inc., if I got the name right. <laughs> Chris uh, Chafe, Executive Director, will join me in a minute and explain if I've actually got that title correct. Uh, so again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have, we're out at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor, and as you can see, we have, I have a ship behind me, and I've come, come properly attired, I think. And uh, so I just want to apologize in advance if we have any technical glitches. Uh, we were de different dealing with a couple of technical difficulties this morning, but hopefully it's all coming through now properly. Uh, so I'm uh, Michelle Claremont from the Marine Museum. And uh, as some of you may know, the Marine Museum has had a long history in Kingston of uh, sharing the stories of our local maritime history, as well as that of the Great Lakes. Uh, our third, first and second virtual talk dealt, had to do more with uh, kind of the environment and uh, dealing with pollution or Great Lakes protection. Uh, but the third one, we thought we'd switch it up and get more a bit more into our historical aspect of it. And we thought, what better way to do that than to uh, have a talk with Tall Ships Expeditions, which is pretty, pretty much in Kingston is the Brigantine St. Lawrence too, which I'm sure some of you have seen out on the waters of this last week. I've seen a number of photos sharing on social media. So um, I'm sure you all know who they are and uh, what ship represents it. So. Without further ado, uh, just a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, in case you, for those of you who don't know, uh, both of our organizations are registered charities. So if you would like to make a, a donation to support the programs that Tall Ships Expeditions does, as well as the Marine Museum, uh, the links to do so will be in the YouTube chat. Just realizing, there we go, straighten this out. Uh, they're available to you uh, on the YouTube chat for you to uh, follow through to their donation, our donation pages. So without further ado, I'm going to flip the camera over to you and introduce uh, Chris Chafe, who, as I said, is the Executive Director of Tall Ships Expeditions Canada, Brigantine Inc. And here we go over to Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello. Thank Hi. you for joining us. No problem. So I know that uh, you are the Executive Director of Tall Ships Expeditions. Yep. Can you explain how your involvement with the organization and how you, that came about? Uh, sure. I, um, I started... Uh, in the organization in 1994, I think, when I was a teenager. So I went through the program when I was young, and um, it did a lot for me. Um, and then, you know, fast forward many, many years and many boats and sea miles and all that sort of stuff. And um, I uh, have ended up back here. So I've been here since 2012. So first as uh, the captain and, and then the operations person and now the captain, the operations person and the executive director. <laughs> All under one hat. Yeah, exactly. Overall skipper of the brigadier. Yes, yeah. Great. Um, so can you just explain a bit more of the organization, what, uh, what you do and how, what, what programs you offer and how you interact with the community? Sure. Um, so, um, yeah, TSCC Brigantine um, is a community and uh, personal development focused outdoor education organization. Right. Um, so we run a few core programs, uh, which are Tall Ship Summer Camp, which is personal development outdoor recreation for youth between um, uh, generally 13 to 18. Some some years it's it's uh, sixteen to twenty three. Sort of depends on where we're sailing, um, but the the core demographic is is high school aged uh, youth, um, and we also do um, team building charters, um, just regular outdoor recreation charters um, for anyone, and um, it's a a heavily uh, volunteer-led organization, so a lot of um, a lot of people from the community uh, get involved with the ship, with the organization, um, in a variety of of ways. Um, yeah, so it really just sort of a community hub around the water and a sort of platform for personal development. Right. Yeah. So if anyone is interested in getting involved, how might they get involved? Uh, just call or email the right. number and email on the website yeah there are right. there are there's a google form to fill out um but the easiest way is just to touch base for the call right. first yeah. or, 
All right. Um, so I understand that the St. Lawrence too has quite an extensive history in Kingston uh, because, well, it actually has ties with our own Ray Museum having been built uh, at the Kingston Shipyard, which yes. is the 55 Ontario Street historic property for anyone who's listening. Um, and also being having been designed uh, by Kingston's own Francis McLaughlin, yes. uh, who was also its first captain, if I'm correct. He was, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so what, what, can you tell us any more about the history of the ship in Kingston? Um, Sure. Uh, yeah, St. Lawrence II is, um, it was like conceived of, funded, designed, and built in Kingston. Um, so the, um, the, uh, um, you know, the, the concept uh, sort of grew out of the Outward Bound movement. Um, there's other people who could probably correct what I'm about to say and, and speak to it with much more authority, but um, uh, essentially um, the Sea Cadet Corps at St. Lawrence um, and Francis had this idea that, that they should develop a training ship for the Corps. Right. Um, and there's, there's actually a lot of like excellent handwritten, um, uh, very idealistic um, I, I guess you'd call them fundraising materials that, that I, we still have, um, that, you know, that was the, the drive, um, that Francis and his father took the community in order to, to develop donations. So, I mean, the boat was built a hundred dollars at a time through community donations. Right. So, you know, this really is just a reflection of the generosity of the community and the community's belief in, um, you know, developing and delivering programming for youth that um, helps give them a leg up and helps them develop. Um, so um, yeah, that's, you know, a lot of the history is, is sort of based on like this concept that you want to help youth um, to grow um, and that, you know, the, the community supports that idea. Um, yeah, so that's where it came from. Um, it wasn't with the Sea Cadets for very long. Uh, before it was sort of handed over to um, Brigantine Incorporated and uh, just sort of opened up as a um, general charitable organization offering programming mm -hmm. for mostly youth, but for the right. community in, in general. Okay. So what what about it do you think lends itself to that youth education? What, what's that attraction? Um, Meaning the vessel itself, or just sail training? Well, I think I think a bit of everything. The vessel okay. itself, definitely. That that is an <laughs> such an iconic piece of yeah. some waterfront um, now. And it, uh... Yeah. So, I mean, it, it it's a ridiculously, needlessly overcomplicated boat for its size, and that is quite on purpose. Right. Um, it you can't run it by yourself. Right. There's very little you can do here without teamwork and without cooperation. Um, and that's, you know, very by design that this boat takes a lot of teamwork to make it run. There's nothing you can do without, uh, without the rest of your team. Um, so, uh, you know, that my, my impression is that this is a very, very effective rig for what we do. Right. Um, because, you know, you, you don't need to add a lot of ancillary programming to what we do to make it valuable because the boat speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in uh, square rig being like a huge component of the value of personal development and outdoor recreation program based on tall ships. Um, and, you know, I think this design is like one of the very best designs uh, out there for um, teaching that sort of thing and running these outdoor education programs on on a, a traditional sailing vessel right yeah i could see that it's a, yeah i mean it definitely goes as you're saying it goes a long way to that team exactly. building part and that's yeah. a, that's a huge component of everything from communication to trust and uh, yes yeah. and uh and being able to facilitate that that sounds yeah. terrific so um and so in terms of the sailing aspect what do you think uh, the kids like most about it what the kids like most about sailing Wind in your hair. Pardon me? Wind in your hair. The wind in your hair. <laughs> I think so. This this boat and for me a lot of like traditional sailing craft um are and all sailing craft. I think traditional sailing craft are just slightly better at it, but um 
there's like this immersion and this connectedness with nature um, that that you get when you are you know out there on a sailing ship using the elements to move yourself around you know that you 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 need to be in tune with with everything that's happening you need to be in tune with the wind the weather the water the ship um your shipmates like and that sense of sort of like being a part of everything and um like that immersion and like direct interaction with nature that you, i think we get further and further away from um there's just a lot of a lot of value in that and i i think young people especially who spend so much time away from that they're you know there's just a lot of value that they develop through that experience um because you get you get young people who get just hooked like immediately um and it's sort of this funny thing where you wouldn't think that a bunch of teenagers would want to hang out on some weird old boat and do hard work and sail around and do dishes and clean toilets and like but they do and they like it because yeah. you know it, it's part of this much broader experience mm -hmm. so i guess that's my answer well, i think it makes absolute <laughs> sense i mean uh yeah. i can think of it in, in other terms for and my my own personal interest but uh i can definitely see how it would relate to the, that connection with nature especially yeah, yeah. You're, right um, you're right there with the elements in some yeah. cases which yeah. hopefully is not too too often <laughs> severe <laughs> elements anyways yeah we try to avoid the severe elements yeah yeah perfect enough um, but never too much yes yeah. exactly just to get your uh, your feet wet yeah but um so what like what age groups do you cater to and where are your your crew coming generally coming from oh all right so um the crew uh i think 13 do we have anyone that's 13 beverly uh, oh, maybe i don't know how old Miller is. <laughs> okay yeah Thir 13 to 19 usually is the the crew age range sometimes a little bit older um people will come back for so they're sort of 20 if, if we need them as more of a volunteer um but the crew come from all over the place so we have two or three crew from kingston several from ottawa a few from toronto um one from newfoundland one from cape breton uh one from uh Iglulik. so um, they come from all over the place yeah. and they can take part in, in, um, a lot of the virtual training. And then, um, you know, the kids who come from away will sort of come down for March break or a week here and there. Um, and that's in dedication. Like yeah. it's not easy to get here from, from St. John's. Um, so you are pretty dedicated at that point Absolutely. <laughs> to getting here. You, they, yeah. you hooked them in. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I understand that you do a lot of uh, trips. You're not always based in Kingston. What so what kind of um, trips do you normally do with you know, your summer programs? So yeah, this summer was this summer and, and next summer uh, are are going to be mostly Lake Ontario, Kingston to Kingston uh, circuits. Um, we're we were going to do very similar things 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. Now the plan moving forward is the 2021 stuff or sorry the 2020 stuff just gets moved forward to 2021. Right. Um, so it's Lake Ontario and a little bit of Lake Erie. Um, then uh, starting in 2022, uh, we're going to be doing Maritime Quebec. Um, so uh, Montreal to uh, Harrington Harbor, uh, then Gaspé, um, overwintering in Riviera Renard. And then 2023 is uh, Western Newfoundland, Labrador to Niatsavut um and then likely over wintering in in uh, nova scotia so the odds are we won't be back in kingston until 2025 oh my so God. 2022 to 2025 the boat will likely be away right so so for anyone who's listening if you want to get on board uh, yeah and uh, the plan for 2022 and 2023 uh is there 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 won't really be um pay-per-use spaces so the the plan is that all the spaces will be subsidized um so you know applicants won't have to pay their way their way is paid um it's just you know we'll, we'll um, bring applicants in and sort of uh, figure out who is going to get the most of the experience who fits best what we're trying to do and um and select people from there okay. you know because we just want it 
we want it to be open to everybody, right. you know, not just people who can afford it. It's just Absolutely. anybody who wants to be involved. That That's a, a thing that happens all the time. So this year there's, um, there's no fee for programming this year. So people can just apply through um, a form. We can only take four trainees at a time right now, but um, people can apply okay. and just get on board if there's no cost right. to them. Yeah. Right. Um, so be just because we're talking about this year and the, the reduced circumstance, uh, yeah. because you know everybody loves to hear about COVID-19. So, yeah, yeah, uh, of course. So, uh, what's, uh, I what, I mean, I remember early on this spring, you were doing a lot of repairs to the ship. And we're are now out of, of, well, of repairs. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what, I guess what, what happened this year? What, were you, what have you been doing? Uh, so we, um, we tore the, the quarter deck off, which is the aft wooden deck uh, that goes over the steel deck. It's really just aesthetic and for um, comfort, right. uh, but it's, you know, part of the look of the boat and part of um, the training program as well, because the the year round full time program involves a lot of um, hands on like heritage trade skills as well. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, we torn the deck off. And then our plan was March break to get most things done. And then we got one day in and had to shut down for a little over two months. Um, so we had ripped the deck off. We had ripped the power out and we had removed the steering system. Uh, so we had to, we basically were two months behind on everything. And then when we came back, um, we had very limited resources because we couldn't have more than a couple of people working at a time. Yeah. Um, so everything just took a long, long time to get done. And it was two, not major, major projects, but fairly major projects. Um, so it just pushed everything way back. Right. Um, but we, you know, we adapted quickly, I think. Like we looked at what was happening and, and came up with a, uh, a response matrix. And okay. then we just kept, as things evolved, we just, sort of selected different uh, paths through this matrix and you know, came to where we are and we got everything done. We were inspected and now we're operational. So, Terrific. so yeah. Good news. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I guess we're just going to switch a bit more to the, uh, the history because uh, sure. for some of I think some of our listeners um, and a little bit myself when I'm still learning the, the nautical ropes yeah. um, is you know, what exactly is a, a tall ship? What, what is a what makes it a brigantine? Okay, so <laughs> people, um, people listening are probably going to laugh yeah, there's when like, I say this. I mean, tall ship is is maybe best just think about it as a marketing term. Um, yeah, there's a million definitions for what a tall ship is. Sail Training International has a definition. The Tall Ship of America has a definition. I don't know if Tall Ships Can has a definition, but um, really it's like, I think that the international definition is like about over eight meters that offers training for youth between like 12 and 25. Okay. But that's, you know, it's, I think often it, it's, it's, a descriptive term for any sort of traditional ship that is of some size and sort of slightly out of the ordinary or has like a historical or historical looking rig. Right. So it's like the term is so broad. Um, I think the actual definition is uh, a, a ship that sets uh, sky sail above royals, Alistair? Yeah. Yeah. So there's like, that would mean there's like two tall ships in the world, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a very, very loosely defined term. Sounds like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, if we, well, if we people know people what think it means, exactly. so it's, you know, yeah. Yeah, or have um, an idea of that. People, in, if you can envision the uh, St. Lawrence too, which I'm sitting right next to us yes. at the moment. Uh, so this is a brigantine. It's a very right. odd brigantine. It's, a bri it's odd brigantine. This is a very odd. Yeah, this is a why strange is, brigantine. So why is it an odd brigantine? A brigantine um, describes a vessel that has a fore and aft rig main mast. So, so you can see two. Cochran here standing on the mainsail, and this is fore and aft rig gear, um, and a fully rigged or square rigged foremast. So the foremast is there and it has the squares across it. Now. Uh, the lower square sail here is called the four course, the foresail, other thing if you want. Um, it's very, very tall. Okay. It's a very, very tall foresail. Um, usually the foresail is quite squat, and then you would have at least two sails above it. So either a, a hoisting topsail and a to gallant, or split topsails, or, or something else. 
very rare to just have two squares on on a brigantine. Um, there was a an excellent picture in a National Geographic from I believe the 70s uh, of a, a a brigantine in Rio de Janeiro that looks identical to this. Really? Yeah, from I think it was the 30s, but like it it could have been Saint Lawrence too. It looked identical. Huh. Um, but that is the only historic photo I have ever seen of a brigantine with only two square sails. Right. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's others, but it is a little, it's a little odd. Yeah. Right. But that's what a brigantine is. It is a brigantine. It's just sort of a strange one. Okay. That's what makes it unique. <laughs> exactly. Kingston yeah. likes to be unique. My, th my thinking on it is that, um, I know Francis used the, uh, the brigantine Yankee as one of the boats he looked at when he was doing the design concepts. Right. And Yankee was similar, where it had a very, very uh, tall course. It was almost more of a what I would describe as schooner sparring for okay. a brigantine. I think that's sort of how I would approach this as well. This is sort of schooner sparring on a brigantine. Um, I'm sure people can disagree with that, but that's how I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna open up a debate on yes, that live yeah. stream here. <laughs> uh, so, and then out of curiosity, what makes a schooner a schooner? Uh, well, so if if we just didn't have the lower sail there, right? Okay, then we would then we would be a schooner. So okay. Usually, you'd have on a boat like this, you'd have a gaff rig main and a gaff rig fore. We have a staysail rig, um, uh, main staysail there, but it would it would still technically be a be a schooner. Okay. So, yeah. But very minute differences. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's where the the trained eye will be able to pick up on these, yes. uh, these subtle ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I understand you have a surprise for us. Oh yeah, we're gonna take a look around the boat. Brilliant. We'll do a little. Uh, we'll do a tour. Um, yeah, we can start uh, start aft and work forward. Is probably the best way to do it. So aft means stern. Yes. As in behind. We'll go to the stern. All right. Okay. We'll head to the stern. All and right. We're gonna you move can, forward. You can. Yeah. Come on board. Excellent. Um, another nautical skateboard here. Very important. There we go. Uh, right, oh, I'm going on board. Okay, right. Watch you my stuff, to. everybody. Yeah, careful. Okay. <laughs> and let me just flip this camera around so we can all see everything. Uh, still, still quick with my my nautical attire, I think. Yeah, you look uh, great. I'm good to go. Fantastic. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, careful here. Uh, we're they're pouring um, some pitch here. Like pouring pitch. Traditional caulking in the deck. It's okay. just like melted glue. This is what holds it together. Uh, no, that just seals the uh, water out. Okay. So, yeah, Watch there's my uh, feet. oakum and pitch. Okay. Don't let Cochran land on you. Okay. Yeah, so. so we have um, uh, the after peak, which I would not maybe look in too much. Okay. It is not nice in there, but it houses the, the steering gear. Um, so we have, uh, I hope you can hear me with all this wind, but it's uh, a quadrant and cable gear. So there's no okay. hydraulics, which means you can, uh, you can actually feel the rudder in the water. Like it's a, it's a, uh, all the navigation <laughs> bits and pieces. So, uh, we oh have, God. uh, yeah. That's where the old needs the new. Exactly. So there's, uh, uh an electronic chart system that runs off of an automated identification system and, and it's GPS. Um, so that's like the sort of new stuff, but right. uh, we also, we use paper charts um, and the most common navigation or fix on the boat is done with a uh, horizontal sextant fix. Um, so we have this is like a sort of a teaching instrument and a safety equipment, right. um, but we still, we still teach people how to, uh, you know, find their position without using the GPS. Yes, so, which I, I quite understand because yeah. sometimes technology fails us. It, yeah, I mean, we have many, many GPSs, but, you know, uh, there's there's no guarantees no. they will always work. And I see you have a ship's compass. Uh, we have a compass, yeah, which is pointing more or less the right way right now. Uh, in the harbor, it gets pretty confused sometimes. At the dock over there, I think north is south, so. Um, yeah, but there's just a lot of metal around. Well, of course, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, so this is the main sail here. Um, main boom, main sail, main gaff, dollar and cover. Um, I, as a younger man, used to be really, really against sail covers because I didn't think they 
it looked very traditional. Right. Um, once you learn how much sales cost and how much damage UV can do to sales, uh, you change your mind about sale covers in a hurry. Right. <laughs> so what happens when a sale is damaged? Um, I don't know if we can see it here. Yeah, so. And it's yeah, right spinning here. around while also balancing everything. And so, I'm not, I haven't got quite my seat legs under yeah. me. <laughs> so you can see here, like, where you'll get the cloth will wear out and the stitching will wear out. You have to put, you know, patches in. Right. Um, we have a brand new mainsail to replace this, but you don't want to use it. Uh, so we have probably another year or two of this. Use it until it is completely done and then switch to a new one. Is there a rule about stepping on ropes? Uh, well, don't step in the bite. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, maybe stuck here. So that's the power input there for the boat. Uh, slash step up onto the deck house. That's the GPS antenna for the AIS. This is the emergency position indicating video beacon. Emergency six man life raft. So, how many uh, to take to Like how many? How, how, how big is the crew? The crew the maximum overnight is twenty-eight. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, these uh, these masts we built in twenty sixteen. Uh, Long way up. Yeah. So the lowers are out of a single piece of Douglas fir. Um, that was a lot of work. Uh, they're very heavy. Oh, I expect. Um, yeah. Uh, we're constantly turning new playing pins, which are uh, because they get broken from time to time. So, if anyone listening wants to do some turning, please call. Um, yes. So, uh, the uh, ramblings and the shrouds used to uh, climb up. The uh, shrouds uh, are meant to uh, support the sailing rig um, so that we don't, we don't break things. Right. Uh, the purpose we use is to we splice all our own cables, so these are all uh, wire spliced in house. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's a we lot of different to, skills. We try to teach a lot of the sort of very traditional stuff. Right. Um, keep that, keep it alive. People can actually do a lot of the, uh, the hands on things that get uh, forgotten about. Um, the wire splicing and wire seizing and a lot of a lot of rope work and stuff. Um, I'm trying to keep the microphone out of the wind here. Yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> so I'm panning around at the same yeah. time. Um, so we can we can move forward. Watch it for this. Uh, it's a work day, so there's actually people, young people, are working on the boat today. Um, yeah, this is our emergency uh, pump here, so it's a gas powered. Uh, for dewatering the boat and uh, doubles as an auxiliary fire pump. Okay. Um, this is the this is the stuff that goes on the deck. That's right, okay. Jeffrey's number two black marine glue. So that's pitch. Um, do you see uh, he's melting some off of this thing here? The nice thing about pitch is that uh, you can you can remelt it. So okay. if it if it breaks away in a seam, you can just take a heat gun and remelt it and reseal. Right. Which is lovely. Um, climbing harnesses. And stuff within this box. Um, the propane system is based in that box, but it's not installed this year because we can't cook on board, so we didn't put propane in for no good reason. Um, life jacket storage is in the ship's boat here. Um, they're not; these are not emergency boats. Okay. You would not want to get in that in an emergency. Um, they're uh, you can row them around. They're good for you know. Main staysail. Uh, it's also used as the uh, the derrick for lifting the boats off. So okay. it's a crane. Uh, it's got a lot of things in it. Uh, anchor here. So just in case. Yeah, this is uh, our 150 pound Admiralty pattern anchor, which does not get a lot of use. This is a 75 pound AP that we use as a kedge anchor. Um, because we don't like to use the engine at all, really, um, you'll often row the anchor out, drop it, and then pull yourself to it. There's no wind to be heard. Right. Get it out of the way. So, um, yep. Uh, let's see. One big life 
raft, two big life rafts. These are, these are 25 man life rafts here. The other one over there. The other one over there. Uh, the officers, Matt's hatch. Oh, I should say that's the midget mess hatch. Oh, skylights okay. are there. Is that any more volunteers? Yeah, that's it. Um, and we, so this deck was done last year. Uh, the deck is uh, uh, eastern white cedar. They last anywhere between like 15 and 30 years, depending on how well they're maintained. Uh, yeah. So hopefully this will last a while. We're actually still finishing it because, as always, we're as you said, the work never ends. That's it. Uh, this is the, uh, the four peak. So chain bins, line storage, uh, general mess right now. Uh, day shapes, all sorts of random bits. Um, in a normal summer, there would be more stuff and it would need to be more organized. Uh, anchor, windless, uh, Adrate automatic. I think the patent's 1911. Some, we have some magazine advertisements for it, but it's a really, really nice uh, windlass. It's got a lot of power. It's really straightforward. You can get. Uh, so it's it's actually uh, two years ago, um, but it, it, it's pretty easy to get on and off. And uh, um, sometimes you have to machine new pieces for it. And, but we want to keep it going, so we just keep making new bits for it, so that uh, we don't have to get a uh, a new windlass. Um, yeah, so bow sprits up there. Um, uh, sometimes called a spike sprit because there's no jaboom above it. Um, and uh, a jib sail and a jib top, or a long liner, whatever you want to call it. So two headsails there. And they'd go right up. Like when they're out, they'd be. Yeah, so that it, of sales we can we can get put on here some bigger some smaller just depending right. on what the wind is like and what exactly we're doing um uh, oh, samson's post here Sam oh, okay yeah. um i see the name yeah. carved into the front here we're uh we're replacing parts of the rail this year um so we got a generous donation of uh a lot of very nice old growth mahogany um so the rod did parts of the rail eventually even nice mahogany goes um, we'll cut that out and replace it this year and then varnish everything up right. hopefully <laughs> might wait till after winter because otherwise we'll do it again uh, right. <laughs> put a protective coating on it um I'm trying to think of what else we can look at here because uh, i don't know if the load is going to work um, what's the muster station oh uh the muster station is where you muster <laughs> In, an and for, in, in layman's yes, terms, that yes. means it is the emergency <laughs> gathering location. All right. Yeah. So if if their uh, general alarm is sounded, um, you line up starting at the muster station. Uh, so there's one either side. If for some reason there is smoke uh, covering this section, you would go to uh, the break on the quarter deck and muster there. Um, so yeah, just the emergency mustering place. Right. Um, yeah, we we spend a lot of time climbing up and down the rig. Uh, so you know, if you don't have to do it, nobody is forced to do it. Um, <laughs> but if you are interested in doing it, uh, you have to go up there to loose the sails and to furl them, and for various other reasons. So uh, five point climbing harnesses with full restraint lanyards. Right. Uh, so that's how we do it. We don't use full arrests uh, because we. When somebody falls, you want them to preferably be able to pull themselves back up. You don't want them falling too far. Yeah. So with, um, with fall arrest, you often end up just dangling in the middle of space, and we really don't want that. So yeah. the lanyards are just short fall restraint lanyards. Um, yeah. All right, That's and uh, a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. 
Um, I'm curious as to why you're flying flying the uh, province de Quebec drapeau. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's because we're mean. I, so we have mean. <laughs> uh, we have uh, three, four, four francophone crew members. Right. And all last summer, they really wanted to get the Quebec ensign on, and they just couldn't find them. And they were really mad that we hadn't brought any Quebec ensigns with us. At the end of the year, we pulled out the flag bin, and there were three Quebec ensigns in there. <laughs> one of them being this rather large one. So we decided to show them that. Uh, yeah, the ensigns were in fact on board. They just right. did a very poor job of looking for it. <laughs> so, I get it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That explains it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the boat has had like a lot of a lot of upgrades the last five to ten years. Right. Um, the everything was emptied out of it in 2017, and the entire interior was sandblasted. Um, any weak spots in the hull were cut out and replated. Uh, a bunch of ribs were replaced. The next time it comes out, uh, we're going to cut the after peak steel out and replace that. Uh, realign the steering uh, shafts and probably re replace the uh, chain bins as well. Right. Um, the uh, the galley, so the cookie area, is new in 2017. Um, the engine and the generator are 2007. They're they're quite recent. Uh, we did an entirely new. Um, battery charging and power management system uh, in 2017 and 2018. Um, so basically like the, there's a lot of original pieces on the boat, but uh, there's there's very little that is worrisome to us anymore. Um, so the boat is in is in quite good shape. Um, our our plan is uh, to get it to 100. That's that's what we're we're aimed at. So we have sort of maintenance plans in place to try and get us to um, be a hundred years old, to a hundred year mark. Right. Assuming. You know, and uh, by my rough calculations, you're at seven. We're getting close to seven. Seventy. So we got a ways to go, but <laughs> Math's you know, not my strong suit. In, <laughs> in you know in, in in ship terms, like thirty years goes pretty fast. You know, it's been almost thirty years I've been involved, so it's not. I'm older than I am willing to admit, but anyway, <laughs> it's, uh, it goes fast. So you need to you need to be planning for the future. Of course. Um, you don't want to be reacting uh, as things happen. You need to be, to be ahead of the game. So of that's we put a lot of effort into doing that. Right. Yeah. So just thinking about because I'm we're, we're talking about the age of the shipping center. Yeah. What uh, I expect you have quite an extensive alumni group. We have a lot of alumni. Get, you guys get together and we go do, out we, on a cruise, or we do. Yeah, from time to time. We actually started last year. Uh, we did the first uh, alumni sale that we have uh, had done in a while, um, and it was fantastic. We were planning another one for this spring, but obviously that that fell through. So we'll um, we'll do another alumni sale. We fingers crossed in 2021. to come back and, and experience it again um, and really like would not say no to anyone who put on alumni we can make them alumni uh, <laughs> so, so uh, technically i'm an alumni now yeah but yeah, there you go <laughs> um, but it was it was a lot of um i love nautical terms uh, i'm just realizing that we're getting a bit like, glitchy in terms of our text okay. i think wait, we'll just uh disembark let's disembark let's disembark yeah all right here we go we're gonna disembark Pipe us off, Jake. <laughs> Part of the training experience. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to flip this back around. Part of the, part of the training is learning how to use the uh, Moses whistle. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Great. We have lots of, uh, lots of different. Uh... So uh, because I know we're getting a bit glitchy and the wind's picking here at the harbor. Um, I wrap this up. I'm not sure what's better direction. Here we go. There's Chris. There we go. <laughs> Six feet apart. Okay. Yeah. There we go. That's close. Um, yeah, so I want to thank again everyone for joining us today and thank you so much for taking us uh, on a tour of the and, uh, and, and explaining a bit more about the programs that you do. Um, again, for anyone who is listening, both uh, the Marine Museum and Tall Ships Expedition. Brigantine Inc. Canada Brigantine Inc. are, are 
fully registered charities. And if you would like to make a, a donation in support of either one of these organizations, the links are in the YouTube feed. I also wanted to point out that um, one, you are obviously doing a lot of programs, but also that Marine Museum has a number of uh, education programs that you can do at home. Uh, number one being on our website is our uh, group of take home activities, some of which involve building boats and trying to sink them or keeping them afloat. Uh, and um, the other one we're doing starting next week is a nautical scavenger hunt for anyone who's interested in getting uh, getting some maritime heritage knowledge and taking a test to see if you can have it. It's a night in prize sponsored by Sister Lock Escapes and Papers Catering. So at night in for six, um, if you complete the scavenger hunt, visit the Marine Museum website, marmuseum.ca, for more information. But all the links that um, and if anything we spoke about today will be available on the YouTube chat. And uh, so I would say thank you again so much for joining us. And I hope to see you again next season on our next uh, virtual talk. Thank you again so much. And bye, Chris. Thank you.